everyone. Today, let's talk a little bit about magma chambers, but let's not talk about them like you usually see online or in a 101 type class. We all have seen in the textbooks and online or wherever of molten liquid magma rising through the crust and exploding onto the surface as lava. You know, you can go anywhere and see that. But I want to talk about something a little different, something that's really an enigma about this whole process. We do know that rock will melt and rise to the crust and either cool underground or dump upon the surface. We know this, and that's not the issue. The issue is, what is really the nature of these magma chambers? Is the magma underground as a melt, under pressure, waiting for that pressure to be so built up that it's gonna pop its cork like a champagne bottle and spill upon the surface? Or is something else going on? Is something not that simple? Is that explanation generally okay? <sighs> That's what we're gonna explore here. But we're gonna stick with a specific type of volcanic occurrence. Not gonna talk about plates subducting one under another and creating a volcanic arc or a line of volcanism along a continental margin. We're going to stick more with like hot spots in the continental crust because there's probably multiple ways that these things exist. And to avoid giving you misinformation, I'm going to stick with that because that's more of what I am familiar with. But here you can see I've drawn a Yellowstone type caldera here in cross section and not to scale. And down here I have our magma chamber with a question mark. And you might be like, wait, Steve, what's the big deal? Yellowstone's a super volcano. It erupts. The magma goes upon the surface. Yes, that is generally correct. That is what happens. But that's not the problem. That's not what I'm trying to address here. What I'm trying to address is the nature of this thing, the nature of this magma chamber. How does this work? Obviously, rock melts, comes up through the crust, pools from whatever reason under the crust, forming a plutonic intrusion, and some of it very well gets to the surface in eruptions and spills upon to the surface. Now, from there, what happens? What happens when this is empty? What happens when this magma ejects to the surface? Does it collapse? Well, yes, it does. And I've talked about this before. You'll often hear me say, the Yellowstone magma chamber is only 15% full. There's actually two magma chambers. And it's something I've said repeatedly in order to make you understand that, unlike in the movies, we're not gonna have this thing just blow up and hell on earth be released. That's not gonna happen. Not only not in your lifetime, but probably not in the next 10 to 20,000 years. And when it does happen, it's not probably gonna be a catastrophic event as portrayed in the movies. And I'll get into that at the end of the video. So let's do situation one, where we have our collapsed caldera from a previous super eruption. And you can see in the drawing here that the caldera has collapsed, rock has fallen in upon the old magma chamber that has essentially popped its cork, emptied out, and the roof can no longer support itself. So it collapses. Now from there, one possibility is the magma rises up again through the area where that chamber used to be, pushing that collapsed crust up, melting it as it goes, and you know, with little eruptions until it forms a little dome on top after a while, pushing that magma up and that melt, and then in one big event, we get a huge explosion and the whole thing pops its cork to start the process all over again. Probably for smaller volcanoes, along continental margins, like Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, that's exactly what happens. But these super volcanoes, oh, and I erased it, in the middle of continents, or even in the middle of oceans, don't usually have that type of eruptive 
power. Now, a lot of times in videos online, you'll see when they show the magma chamber underground, there's like this cave thing and the magma's boiling underneath and all this fun stuff. But that's just done to illustrate to you what's going on in a very generic sense so they can talk about it. That doesn't happen. There is no empty cave underground with boiling magma throwing itself around like that. That's not what happens. That's just for illustration purposes. But of course, they never tell you that in those videos. So you might get that picture in your head. So what exactly is the nature of these things? What exactly does happen? And the honest answer is, we're not sure. Now, through seismology, we can determine the basic internal structure of the Earth. That's how we know we have a liquid outer core, a solid inner core. That's how we know the mantle is solid. But these plumes don't show up that clearly. They aren't filled with magma waiting to pop their corks. Like I said, you may hear me talk about some chamber being 15% full. Well, that sounds weird, Steve. If magma doesn't exist underground in massive caves, how can a magma chamber be only 15% full? And that's a good question. And here's the answer. Um, rock, rock melting potential and slushy rock? Is, is, that, is that a way to say it? I don't know how else to put it. I'm gonna to try to describe it to you the best I can. But when we look at these things through seismology, we don't see a sharp boundary. We don't see S waves going through the crust and then terminating at these magma chambers. What does that tell us? Well, that tells us that the magma isn't necessarily in a melted state at that point. Because remember, S waves only travel through solids. They don't travel through things like liquid. Now you could argue that it's so under pressure and so tight that the S waves would go through because it's so viscous. But here's the thing, these melts aren't like that. We can melt rocks in the lab. We can put them under pressure a little bit and we don't get a pseudo solid, if you will, especially not near the surface. When I'm talking near the surface here, I'm talking, you know, 50 kilometers or shallower, you know, 30 miles or shallower. That's what I mean by shallow magma chamber and a super Yellowstone type caldera there. So I said S waves don't stop moving through the crust as they go through these magma chambers, as they would be expected to do by the laws of physics if they encounter either a liquid or a gas like a big open cave. So what exactly does happen? Well, I'm not going to go into any numbers here, but I'm just going to talk very basically about some things. S waves or shear waves are the waves that propagate through a body but that body has to be a solid. No solid, no S waves. Why? Because you can't shear a liquid, you can't shear a gas. You can only shear a solid. P waves, on the other hand, which are a form of compressional wave, can travel through any medium. If, if it's solid, liquid, gas, it doesn't matter. Sound waves are compressional waves. I'm not going to address those because they'll go through just about anything. But I do want to sit here and talk about the nature of these waves really quick because as you know, you have your cross section of your earth here and I'm just going to make some arbitrary layers in here. All right. We'll say on the surface we have an average density of about 2.0 and these are all going to be in grams per centimeter cube. I'm just going to leave off the units for brevity sake there. And then down here you have two. 0.7 down here you have 2.9 and then it drops down here to 2.1 and then down here you have a 3.0 now we're not going to get into ray theory or anything like that but rays seismic waves propagate through the planet like you have something here you know, we'll just say an earthquake because earthquakes, remember epicenters, uh, you hear that all the time on news and earthquakes, but the epicenter is the surface reflection of where the earthquake actually occurred. This is called the focus. Now it has to occur along a fault 
or something like that because it's brittle failure, but just roll with me here. That's not the point of this. But when an earthquake occurs, what happens is it sends these waves out in all directions. But for simplicity purposes, we don't model them this way. And we can do the same thing on the surface. We can generate some sort of impact on the surface. If we want just real shallow stuff, we get someone out there with a steel plate and a sledgehammer and they hit the ground, we get seismic data. But those waves propagate through the ground like this, you know, as, you know, ripples in a pond, if you will. They're, they're spherical for all intents and purposes, but we don't model them as their spherical waves propagating through the earth. Why? Because it's really complex and we don't need to do that. But as these waves travel through, certain things happen. And my number densities here. The, most waves go through the earth, they speed up when the density of the material is greater. Sound waves, for example, will travel faster and be more pronounced through a solid than through the atmosphere. If you don't believe me, take a comb and do this. You can hear it. Take that same comb. Now put your ear next to it and do it and listen to what happens. It's probably gonna be tricky to film. Hopefully the camera won't fall, but you put your ear down on the surface and then you draw your comb. Did you hear that? Do you hear how much louder that is? Now I'm gonna put the phone directly on here cause it's not laying perfectly on it and it'll sound even louder when I do it. Here we go. Let's move the support. It's gonna go dark, sorry. So the whole point of that demonstration was to show you that waves propagate faster through more dense material. That's all I want you to get out of that. So we have these waves traveling through, but we follow what's called rays. And that's ray theory, and that's a topic for another time. We can model these as lines instead of spheres. So what will happen is something will move through the earth, it'll hit something more dense, it speeds up, changes direction, more dense, speeds up, changes direction again, density drops, the wave will slow down until it hits something else, it'll also change direction, and before it comes down to the more dense stuff again and speeds up and continues along its course. Now while this happens, you get return signals, and that's what you pick up on your geophones. So that's basically how this works. Why am I telling you all this? Because it's relevant when trying to figure out these magma chambers. Now, before I get into magma chambers again, someone did ask me a question, and it's actually a good one, and I want to address it really quick. I'm going to talk about the core of the Earth. Most of you have already seen me do this many times. We have our basic structure of the Earth. Technically, there's only three physical layers. You know, you have the lithosphere, the mantle, and the core. But we're going to divide the inner and outer core up. This is our outer core, and this is our inner core. Our inner core is solid, and our outer core is liquid. And you heard me say, well, S waves don't go through liquids, and they don't. And what happens is if we have an earthquake, it doesn't matter where it is on the Earth. It, we just put these things on top, you know, tilt the Earth whichever way you want to get your earthquake on top because it's easier. What will happen is your S waves will hit this, and they will deflect or just stop like this. So we get what's called an S wave shadow zone. From here, we don't get S waves in this area. Now, there are... P wave shadow zones too, but I'm not going to address those here. Uh, so you might sit there and say, well, Steve, is S waves never go through liquid and the outer core has to be a liquid because they don't go through there. How do we know the inner core is a solid? And well, actually, P waves are part of that equation, but shear waves and all these mechanical waves can often be translated into other waves. Now, depending on the nature of the material it's traveling through, you can get an S wave coming down this way. It hits here, gets translated into something else, 
comes down here, speeds up, becomes an S wave again, comes here, and then retranslates into that other wave, and then S wave again, and comes out the other side of the planet. And you may sit there and say, well, Steve, that sounds ridiculously complicated, but this almost never happens. This rarely happens, but it does happen. Mostly how we know is from P waves, because P waves will go through the earth, and this mantle is overall less dense than the outer core, and so it'll change direction and speed, a P wave. It hits that dense, solid inner core, once again, changes direction and speed, then leaves, and it just changes direction and speed until it comes out the other side of the planet. And we use those arrival times to discern the interior of the Earth. But S waves, just so you know, can translate into other waves. One type of wave, mechanical wave, can become another type of mechanical wave. And I just wanted to address that really quick because that was a really good question someone asked me. Okay, so here we have a generic cross-section not to scale of our Yellowstone type caldera very loosely. And as you can see here, I've drawn two magma chambers and this is my profile. You can see there is some sort of caldera. Once the magma releases, it can collapse in on itself. And as that magma melts underneath the ground, well, it becomes less dense, even though it may not be erupting, so it can lift the ground up a bit. But that doesn't really answer what I'm trying to go for here. So we know we do get partial collapse, but Quite honestly, if the magma chamber completely emptied an eruption and spilled everything upon the land, this caldera would be excessively deep. We're talking probably a couple dozen kilometers deep, and it's not. So there is no complete collapse of everything that has spilled out. Well, there could be several reasons for that. One could just be your magma chamber as it, everything spilled out onto the surface, new magma that released more pressure and more water to the system came up and stopped that collapse from filling that void all the way. The problem with that is that's not what we see in the seismic reflections. What seems to happen, when we, you know, we know Yellowstone is an active volcano, but that doesn't mean it's gonna pop its cork. These magma chambers, when we get the earthquakes we get here, we get the waves, our, wa our S waves coming through, and if this was a cavern or a liquid, they would stop, but they don't. They continue on straight through. What does that tell us? Well, that tells us two things. Our magma chamber can't be a liquid, and it can't be a gas, which means there's no cave down there. So these things continue to propagate through. now they do decrease in velocity as they hit it, and your, so do your other waves. That's how we know the outline of this thing. We use those arrival times, and that's how we know there's two basic chambers, but that doesn't tell us the nature of those chambers. We do know some of it is molten, but very little of it is molten. In other words, it's not all melted rock. Well, if it's not melted rock, what is it? Well, some is, that's how we know it's 15% full, you know, or whatever number I throw at you, 15% is for one of the chambers, but honestly, I forget which one, I don't remember off the top of my head. The point is, neither of them is majority of the way filled with melt. It's probably solid crust, what we call something like that. So it's rock that has the potential to melt or you know but it's a potential solid what that means is it just is potentially can easily change phases it can easily go from a solid to a liquid or vice versa because it's near that transition but technically it's on the other side of the fence we're not going to get into solidus and liquidus and all that stuff that's too complex for this lecture but if you want to look those up go ahead and look those up but basically they're solids they're just a very weak solid because although they're solids, they're a lot hotter than the surrounding crust, which is cooler. So their temperature, their inherent temperature from the last time they erupted or whatever, it still has residual heat, even though it's a solid. So it has that 
easier potential to melt. And now we know this whole system has a lot of groundwater in it, at least near the top. We get a lot of stuff up here. And well, obviously we know that because we get geysers like Old Faithful. So that's due mostly to, you know, magma, the part that has melted, rising through the crust, hitting that water, changing it into high pressure steam until that pressure can be released. What this also does though, is it allows water to go back down to the chamber a lot deeper than it normally would. And for those of you that have followed me for a while, you'll know that, you'll know that there's a couple things that can lower that melting temperature. Now, pressure is one. We release pressure that lowers that melting temperature. The rock can melt and force its way up because it's less dense, more buoyant. And the other thing, is water. Water will drop that melting temperature even more. Once water is introduced into that chamber, that potential rock will melt a lot easier. Now there's gases and things too that will lower these melting temperatures, but it's really hard to get them into the system as a hot spot like this. It's more common along subduction zones where you can bring those gases down with ocean water and other things like that. Although I'm sure there are some gases in here. Our magma chamber, even though it's a solid, it's already poised to melt. It's hotter than the surrounding crust. The pressure has been lowered in the chamber, partially because of its heat and its accessibility to the surface. And the introduction of water lowers that temperature even more. So what happens after time as the magma chamber fractures a little bit, some more water gets into the system, all right? We get more heat being generated from down here, from deeper upwelling magmas, and that solid rock will once again begin to melt. And right about now, one of the chambers, like I said, I forget which one, is only about 15% magma. The rest is this magma chamber. And even though we say it's an empty magma chamber, it's not empty in the sense of there not being anything there. It's empty in the sense that the potential rock has not melted yet into a magma. And as time goes on, what will happen is more will melt. And that rock that has the potential to easily melt is obviously going to melt before any new country rock melts. And while this is happening, some of it will be very accessible following fractures within this to the surface and we'll get minor eruptions. This magma chamber, even though it's mostly empty, 85% or so, it's not a big empty void in the ground. It's not like the empty of space or the empty in a container or something like that. It's not filled with gas or no gas. It's filled with solid rock that has the potential to easily melt. At least that's what we think, or one of the ideas of how these things actually are. And it does make a lot of sense, because even though our seismic waves that wouldn't pass through if this was an empty chamber or a liquid are passing through, so we know it can't be a liquid or a gas. So it, but you know, some of it is, is molten, it's melted, we do know that, from the seismic reflection data. Over time, what happens is this will just melt more and more, and it'll melt all this potential rock first because that's the easiest to melt. It's not going to readily melt the country rock, although it could incorporate some of If a new massive heat source, if the next plume that comes up from deep in the mantle is very hot and very buoyant, it could encourage further melting of the crust around it. But you got to remember, as these melts, even though they're less dense, more buoyant, and when they come up through the crust, the crust is going to try to stop that. It doesn't want that magma to come up. It's not easy for it to do it. If it was, we would have eruptions all over the earth all the time, constantly, and we don't. So there is that sort of check. A lot of times certain layers will get hit, the magma will come up, and spread. 
But anyway, before I digress too much and get into that. <laughs> okay, now our magma chamber is full. It's full of melted rock. Now you've got your pressure cooker. So more and more is going to force its way to the surface and smaller and smaller eruptions, probably mostly through this side in this case, because it has a lot more to go through here. So we'll just stick to that side. So it's going to come up more and more, forming more and more. And then eventually it will pop its cork. But to what extent? Well, just because a magma chamber exists and just because it can be 100% full of magma. It doesn't mean it has to get that way before it pops its cork. If the underlying heat source is weaker than it used to be, this whole thing isn't going to become molten again. Just a certain part of it will. You know, it'll come up. We'll just say this part is molten. And it'll erupt, but it won't be as bad of a scenario as the previous mega eruption. Now, there's a misconception about this whole thing here. We've all seen the movies where Yellowstone mega explodes and destroys everything on Earth and all that. Well, even in its previous three mega eruptions, if you will, and it has erupted in between then as well. It's just we don't sensationalize that stuff. It's erupting right now. OK, it's just not newsworthy because the planet isn't ending. But even if we just had those three other mega eruptions, they didn't stop life on Earth. Yeah, it really sucked for anyone around it for a few hundred or a few thousand kilometers, but it didn't end life. Obviously, it didn't because we're here. Even if there is going to be a next mega eruption, the likelihood of it being a civilization ending event, like if it happened today, wouldn't really necessarily occur. I don't think it would end our civilization per se. It's not going to be that drastic. I don't think it has the potential to be that drastic. I mean, it could, but it definitely would not extinguish our species. That would not happen. There would be many of us left. Just like there were many of hominids left the last time this happened. They were just on the other side of the world. So it wouldn't be an extinction level event is what I'm getting at there. I don't even think it would be a civilization ending event. But then again, I'm also the guy who thinks we're not going to have any more of these mega eruptions. Why is that? Well, because these type of super volcanoes and these hot spots, they don't pulsate. They don't get those mega eruptions indefinitely. That hot spot cannot continue to feed to the continental crust. Now, the oceanic crust, like with Hawaii, it's a lot easier. That chain is over 20 million years old. That hot spot hasn't moved. The plate moves, forms a new island, etc., etc. That plate is highly mobile. Well, you can even see in North America, you can follow the path of the Yellowstone caldera as the North American plate has moved. We used to think this Yellowstone caldera was about 20 million, 30 million years old, somewhere in there, which is already old for one of these. But now there's some evidence that it might be on the order of 50 million years old. These things generally don't last that long. Why? I don't know. It probably has something to do with plates subducting into the mantle, depending on where these hot spots are generated. Now, they stay motionless relative to the moving plates, but they're probably generated as a plate dives into the mantle, creating more pressure, more density on the underlying rock, because it's still got to make room and push a little, generating these melts that come up. And as long as that plate is descending, that has a source of melt, a source of magma to be used to generate these hot spots. Whether they generate now, if they generate at the core mantle boundary, that's a different story, but we don't know that for sure. But we do know these things don't live forever. 20 million years is an old hot spot, a 50 million year old one is an ancient hot spot. And if this caldera is ancient, it's about to either do one of two things. Yellowstone is about to go extinct as a supervolcano. It will still erupt for a while, probably over the next 
million years or so, no extinction level type things, unless you're sitting in the caldera itself, but it will continue to erupt. And then it'll eventually go quiet. Or, and I've talked about this before, the hot spot will remain because right now North America is riding over not only a subducting plate, but an active fast spreading rift zone related to the East Pacific rise. Much faster spreading zone than what's happening in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, usually when this happens, you can subduct spreading centers. I know that sounds bizarre, but it happens. But this spreading center is so active and moving so fast. And with the Yellowstone caldera and the basin and range extension, I don't think it's going to go extinct. I think the Yellowstone hotspot is going to become a triple junction and we're going to start getting a rift there spreading down to the basin and range. The other option is Yellowstone goes extinct. The basin and range eventually stops extending and the East Pacific rise gets subducted into the mantle. And that's the end of the story. So I can't tell you which scenario is going to happen, but what I can tell you is even if far in the future, 10 million years from now, it does become this initiation point of a spreading center, that won't lead to massive, huge volcanic eruptions anymore. They'll be more quiet. We won't get mega eruptions anyway. And North America will quietly split. Now you've heard me toss terms out there, triple junction, spreading center, things like this. What do those mean? Well, I will just link some of my older videos so you can look at those because if I start rambling about them, we're gonna take up another hour or two and I don't wanna do that. That's it. If you guys have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Check out the other videos and I hope you learned something.